worship. In your Bibles, you can turn to 1 Samuel chapter 24. First Samuel 24. I'm going to start in verse 1. We'll read 1 through 7. 1 Samuel 24, 1 through 7. Starting in verse 1. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there. And Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterward, David was conscience stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lift my hand against him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. First of all, I want to um, thank Matthew Mockner for um, sharing with, the, with you the, um, the message last week. Um, I heard he did a great job, and I heard he spoiled you um, with the length of the sermon. I want you to know that I save all of my words all week long so that I can speak on Sunday morning, and so you, don't, you, you won't be spoiled um, with me of shortening the, the length of the sermon. But uh, today is Memorial Day weekend. And uh, Memorial Day in the United States is a federal holiday, which occurs every year on the final Monday of May. I guess our school systems aren't used to um, going to school this long, so they, poor students and teachers, you have to go to school tomorrow. But the minute about everybody else will be off. Um, Formerly, this day was known as Decoration Day. It originated from the American Civil War to commemorate the Union and Confederate soldiers who died in the Civil War. By the 20th century, Memorial Day had been extended to honor all Americans who have died in all wars. It typically marks the start of the summer vacation season while Labor Day marks its end. For many parts of the United States, this is the time of the year when things start to get warm. We recognize here we get a head start on that um, most years. Many people visit cemeteries and memorials, particularly to honor those who have died in military service. And I recognize that Memorial Day is a, a holiday to remember those who have died in battle. But as a church, we like to take the opportunity to honor those who have served our country in the armed forces. And so if you have served our country in the armed forces, would you please stand up? We'd like to recognize and honor you, all those who have served in military forces, wartime, non-wartime. <laughs> In a movie, V for Vendetta, we hear a famous poem. Remember, remember the 5th of November, gunpowder, treason, and plot. I see no reason why gunpowder, treason, should ever be forgot. These words, remember, remember, refer to Guy Fawkes. And on the 5th of November in 1605, Guy Fawkes was caught in the cellars of the Houses of Parliament with several dozen barrels of gunpowder. He was then tried as a traitor with his co-conspirators for plotting against the government. Fox was then sentenced to death. The following year began an annual practice of remembering the 5th of November and the gunpowder plot. A nursery rhyme was written to ensure that this crime would never be forgotten. You know, there are things in our life that are worth remembering. There are things, you know, the things that we try to forget, it seems like we remember. Things that we try to remember, we seem to forget. Uh, we talk about our memories and, but, you know, and the things that we should remember. And there are things that are worth remembering um, in our lives. I read an article recently about different ways that we could help remember things. A uh, couple suggestions that this article gave were uh, to write it down. That would help us in our memory. One was interesting, stay healthy, because a healthy body, a healthy mind will remember better. 
uh, goes on to say, record your thoughts, use a recorder, say the things you need to remember. Another interesting one was believe in yourself. Because we keep saying about ourselves, well, I have a terrible memory, I have a terrible memory. And then we just, re that's what we believe after a time. So we need to believe in ourselves, yes, I can develop a better memory. And that would help us with our, our bad memories. Um, send reminders to yourself by email or text. Find ways to remind yourself. Sticky notes, setting timers, setting alarms, all sorts of ways to help us remember because there are things that we need to remember in our lives. One writer said there are two good ways to remember things. One is repetition. Studies have shown that most people need to think and repeat something at least 20 times to be able to remember it. And then the other was those memory tricks that are associated where you associate new information with some familiar things. I read about an elderly couple who had been experiencing declining memories over time, so they decided that they wanted to, to go one, to one of those power memory conferences where you're taught to remember um, things by association. So a few days after the class, the old man was outside talking to his neighbor about the class and how much it had helped him. And the neighbor asked, well, who's the instructor for that class? Oh, hmm... The old man thought, he says, you know, you know that flower, you know that one that smells really nice and is really pretty, but it has those prickly thorns, you know what flower I'm talking about, what flower is that? And the man says, a rose? He says, yes, that's it. Hey, Rose, what's the name of that teacher uh, from the memory class? I'll tell you one more thing about remembering before we get to David and Saul. Uh, many of you know that I participated in an Ironman triathlon last Saturday. If you're not sure what that is, you um, start out as a group, usually about 2,200 of us, um, and you start out with a 2.4-mile swim in open body water, and then you um, ride your bike for 112 miles, and then you run 26.2 miles, or you participate in 26.2 miles, you're not necessarily running. Uh, there, are day, there are things about that particular day that I will always remember, and there are things that I will forget. I will forget the pain and extreme exhaustion that I experienced that day. Last Sunday morning, it was on Saturday, last Sunday morning, um, I was asked, are you going to do this again? And my answer was an emphatic no, because I could remember the pain and the exhaustion that I felt. But as time has gone since last Sunday morning, if someone were to ask me, and people have, I'll say, well, maybe, and it's some sort of a thought that it could actually happen again, whereas at that point it was absolutely no um, because of the, the fatigue I was feeling but I'll always remember the sense of accomplishment. Go ahead and bring up the, um, the, the next slide. The sense of accomplishment. From crossing that finish line. You have a period of time from 7 a.m. when it starts until midnight. You have to have this done in 17 hours. I used about all of my 17 hours. I'll always remember my friends... Um, and especially Darla and Parker being out there cheering for me um, as I was doing this. And I'll remember some of these total strangers that were cheering for me as well. And I do want to say special thank you to Darla because there's a whole lot of getting back and forth and doing things and getting ready and taking stuff um, just so that I could do something like this. And she was right there um, helping me. She was really awesome and all that. And I really appreciate it. She needs the hand because she was the iron person. I'll always remember the messages that I read on Facebook and text messages um, after the event. I'll always remember that um, and the encouragement that I had um, from, my, from my friends and, and family members. Those are things that you will always remember. Sure, there's things that I'll forget about it, but there are things that are worth remembering that I'll always remember it. In life, there are things worth remembering. 
So let's go ahead and get back to David and Saul and see the things that they remembered and see how that applies to us in our lives today. Now this is a very interesting event in the life of David. Saul has been pursuing David. We've talked about this the last few weeks. David has been hiding from Saul along the way. And God has kept them apart many times. We've talked about the provision of God and how he kept David safe and kept him away from Saul. Now at the end of chapter 23, Saul was pursuing David and actually getting very close to David. And was getting, David was getting in a trapped situation and Saul was closing in on David. And this is again where God brought provision. The Philistines started to attack Israel. And word came to Saul as he was closing in on David, he received word about the Philistines who were in Israel attacking the people. And at that point, Saul needed to act like the king and help his people. He had to get rid of this vendetta that he had of, of trying to kill one man. And he had to go back and do what he was supposed to do as a king and take care of his people. So Saul took his army, left David, went back, fought against the Philistines, moved them back out of the land. That skirmish was over. And then Saul continued with that same pursuit of David. And he started to pursue him as we see in chapter 24. Saul had an army of 3,000 soldiers. David had an army of 400 men. Remember the castaways that, that ended up following David around. And so now Saul is after David. Doesn't know exactly where David is, but he's getting closer to him. So close that David and his men hid in a cave. Must have been a very big cave. And they're all hiding in this cave. And this is where the Bible gets very real. And says, Saul went into that cave to relieve himself. There are no porta potties set up along the way. And so that's what Saul had to do. Well, David's hiding in that cave. And his men, when they see that Saul has come in for this, they tell David, God has placed Saul in your hands. You need to go and kill him, basically. And so David sneaks up on Saul and gets so close that he's able to cut off a portion of the corner of Saul's robe. Now let me say something about this. I don't know if you thought about this in reading this and hearing this. The men, when they were giving David advice, they were sure that they knew God's will. They were sure that they understood God's plan in all of this. And that plan was for David to go and snatch that crown. Take it from Saul by killing him. And so his men just knew that was the case. They knew it was the will of God. Were they right? No, they weren't. At least according to David. Because David, he comes back and he does not let his men kill him. He doesn't kill Saul. And we're going to find later on, David is going to... Uh, make some, he's going to make some statements about what God has to do before he's going to become king and he's going to leave that all in the hands of God. Now here's my warning. We need to be very careful when we hear people in our lives. It could be in, the, it could be in this church, it could be in other churches, it could be people you hear on the radio or TV where they start their advice to you with it's the Lord's will that you do this. Or God is telling me that you need to do that. These men knew it was the will of God for David to kill Saul. But it wasn't the will of God. And so just because somebody uses those words, it does not guarantee that they know the will of God. Sometimes they can be very sincere and they can believe that this is, you know, they think this is the will of God. But you, if you hear someone come to you and say, this is God's will for your life, the Lord needs to confirm that in your life. He needs to confirm that um, in your spirit and with the word of God. So, just, you know, I think sometimes people throw out that statement and don't realize how powerful it is. But we need to always examine what, when others say they know what God's will is for your life, make sure you examine what they say uh, and to make sure that they're actually right. Because here's an example where they were wrong, completely wrong, but they thought they knew the will of God in this situation. Yes, God leads, He directs, but we just always need to be very careful when others tell us what they think the, the will of God is in our lives. So let's get back to David and Saul. 
let's talk about the things that were worth remembering in their life um, so we can see what's worth remembering in our life. Number one, David remembered the promise of God. David remembered the promise of God. He would be king, and he knew that. And that's the thing that, remember we talked about how he probably struggled with that for a while, but now he's, he's very confident in this fact that he will be king someday. But even though he remembered the promise of God, he was waiting for God to fulfill that promise in God's good time. And that's important for us in our lives. As we think about the promises of God, we need to recognize that God will fulfill those promises in His time. We don't have to snatch those promises. And that's one thing we're going to see as we go through this whole story of David. We see what Saul had a stranglehold on the crown. He wanted to keep that crown. That's, that was his life. We're going to find out later on, Absalom, David's uh, son... He had that same attitude about the crown. He wanted to snatch it and hold it. Whereas David seemed to be the only one of these three that was willing to wait for God to give that crown or take that crown away according to God's will. David remembered the promise of God and he believed that promise and he stood firm in that promise. He knew it would happen, but he was going to let it happen, happen by God's will and by God's timing. He wasn't going to... He wasn't going to take matters into his own hands. That was, and that's worth remembering. We need to remember the promises of God. Secondly, David remembered that Saul was still king. And that's a very important point to understand about David and his patience in all of this. Uh, in fact, after he cut off the corner of that robe, he felt bad about even doing that. He knew he would become king but he remembered at this point right now, Saul is the king and I need to act accordingly. Look at verse 5 and 6 again. He says, it says, Afterward David was conscience stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. And then when David came out of that cave, he had a little conversation with Saul at a distance. You know, he couldn't get it right to Saul, but at a distance he calls out to King Saul and they have this conversation. Look at what David says to Saul. Look in verse 8. Then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul, My lord the king. When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. He said to Saul, Why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you? This day you, will, you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in that cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lay my hand on my Lord because he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but did not kill you. See that, there, see that there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I am guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. David had done nothing wrong, and yet Saul was bent on destroying him. Saul was afraid in this power situation, that, uh, and, and he wanted, to, because of his fear, he wanted to destroy David. That happens in our lives. We do the right thing and people around us are bent on destruction, usually out of fear, usually out of a desire for power. And, but we, and we see what David did in this. He said, I have done nothing to harm you. You can see this. Here's proof. I could have killed you. And by you know, holding up the corner of that robe, he says, this is proof that I, I am not out to try to destroy you. So that's what David remembered. He remembered the promises of God. He remembered that Saul was still the king. Yes, God had anointed David, but Saul was still anointed. And as, as the anointed king, David looked at him as his master. He would have gladly come back and served Saul. But every time you know, he would be close, Saul would try to kill him. And so he had to flee. He had to stay away from him. But he was not going to take things in his own hands. And he was going to allow, uh, allow God to do what he was going to do. To fulfill that promise. Now let's see what Saul remembered, because this is important here. Number three, Saul remembered David's faithfulness. 
That's what he remembered that day. And that affected what he did. At least for a time, it affected what Saul did. Look down at verse 16. When David finished saying this, Saul asked, Is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud. You are more righteous than I, he said. You have treated me well, but I have treated you badly. You have just now told me about the good you did to me. The Lord delivered me into your hands, but you did not kill me. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? May the Lord reward you well for the way you treated me today. I know that you will surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. Now swear to me by the Lord that you will not kill off my descendants or wipe out my name from my, fam from my father's family. So David gave his oath to Saul. Then Saul returned home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. Saul remembered David's faithfulness and at that point stopped pursuing him. He could have taken his army. He could have gone after David. But at that point, he stopped pursuing him when he recognized David's faithfulness. He understood the will of God. As I mentioned this before, he knew David is going to become the next king. And, and there, that's why he asked, don't, you know, don't kill off all my family. Uh, one, of the, you know, one of the things we haven't talked about was David and Jonathan. Jonathan, the son of the king, said to David, you will be the next king. I want to serve you. And if, according to David, if it would have been David's will and Jonathan's will, that's exactly what would have happened. Jonathan would have submitted himself to David as the king. He would gladly have done that because he knew that that was the will of God. Where, so at this point, Saul recognizes you're going to be the new king. I know that. Um, he recognizes the faithfulness of, God, of David and he stops the pursuit. He goes back home. David can't follow him because he knows what's going to happen. Saul will eventually change his mind and start pursuing him again. But as we look at all the events of that, of that thing that happened, those are the things that are worth remembering for them. David needed to remember God's promises. He, re he needed to remember that Saul was king. And it was good at that, at least for that time, that period of time that Saul remembered David's faithfulness. And there are things worth remembering in your life. You know, when we think about the things that we remember, we have to be very careful because the easy thing for us to remember are the bad things, the negative things. Those are the things that seem to just keep swirling around in our mind um, to try to bring us down and, and destroy relationships of just remembering the bad. Um, and if we're, if we're not careful, we will go through life and we will go through our relationships and we will always remember the negative. And not just remember it, but we'll keep bringing it up and it will always fester and harm our relationships we, we tend to want to remember the wrongs and we want to remember the injustice and we tend to remember the difficult people. It seems at time we want to remain, it seems like that we want to remember the pain and turmoil that we've gone through. For some reason, we just keep remembering that. But folks, we need to change our, our thinking about remembering. We need to remember the, the good and the right things. The things that are worth remembering in our lives are God's blessings. We need to remember those blessings that God gives to us. We need to remember God's faithfulness to us in our lives. We need to remember His commands as well and follow those commands. We need to remember His promises just like David remembered the promises of God. We need to remember what we need to do to follow the Lord. Those are the things that we need to focus on and remember in our lives. And as we think about our relationships of the people that are around us in our lives, that we go through this life together, let's remember the encouragements. Let's remember the support. Let's remember the help that we've received from others. Let's remember those things as we remember the, our relationship with our friends and our family. Now, I'm not talking about, well, let's just never bring it up and let's just try to forget all the bad things. No, I'm talking about deal with it. If there's an issue, deal with it. Make it right. Um, reconcile. Um, bring forgiveness. Do what we need to do in those relationships. But once that 
once we come to that point where we can forgive and, and things are right, let's remember the good. Let's remember why we have these relationships with others and, and the benefit of that instead of constantly um, bombarding our mind with the negative thoughts of what, of what happened in our lives. Yes, there are things worth remembering in our lives. Let's examine what we remember and remember the things that will build us up and strengthen us as we follow the Lord and as we serve one another, as we seek to do God's will. Let's pray. Father, thank you for um, just the, the life that you give us. Thank you for um, the, to the idea that we know that you forgive us of our sins and for you, you remember them no more. And I know, Lord, that in our lives that we can't do that with a snap of a finger, but, but Lord, we can, uh, we, can, we can remember the things that are good in our lives. We can, we can focus on the blessings and the encouragements in our lives and those, and those times of, um, of, of good times. And Lord, I just pray that you would um, strengthen us, lead us, guide us in our memories, Lord, so that we will... Remember the things that bring honor to you and strengthen ourselves and strengthen others. In Jesus' name, amen.